Okay, so um, our next speakers will be uh, Kartor, Kartel, uh, Linus, and Dominique. Uh, and they are gonna be talking about disclosure, hack, and back, how to mess things up in various ways. Please give a big applause to our speakers. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Um, we uh, basically thought we want to talk a little bit about the adventures we've had in the past year, uh, sp with a specific focus on the past half year, in incident response, in handling incidents, causing incidents uh, by uh, disclosure. And we'll basically talk about uh, our disclosure adventures first. So many of you may know that the CCC regularly well, discloses vulnerabilities to companies. Uh, we also have an email address where we help people doing so. That email address will play a role in a, in a bit here. Um, so, Kantorkel, my good friend, uh, reported a lot of incidents uh, in, in bulk. Basically, it was like he had like this, um, like a spreadsheet to keep track of all the, all the disclosures. And we had to, you know, look into it together and make sure that, you know, which state is it in and do you have everything. And eventually we only made it a small blog post of 6.4 million data records in over 50 leaks that we disclosed to, the, uh, to those companies. Now, you would think that's a process you could scale, right? You build a sp uh, spreadsheet and say, like, have we sent the email? Have we received the response? Right? Is it fixed? But once this is at 50 and you're dealing with 50 different organizations, it gets a bit more complicated. Still, disclosure is a simple process in theory, right? You find a vulnerability, you tell the people that are responsible for the vulnerability, they fix it. If you look at this as a, in terms of like a you know, call flow, you, know, you do the research, report, the, report it to the company, just in case they forget to uh, alert the CERT or the data protection officer, you just do it for them as well, right? Just so they, you know. Um, they usually uh, send you an ACK, then they uh, perform their duties and notify the DPA. They fix the issue, and they th th send you like a little thank you note, uh, and they notify the customers. You can, of course, imagine which parts they sometimes like to forget about. So maybe we then do a little publication to take care of the customer notification for them on top of that. So now with 50 of these in the past years, or in the past year, um, Kantorkel has a lot of little adventures to talk about and please give him a big round of applause. So yeah, let's start with one of the cases that went quite well, I would say. So there was this Spanish media company that owns, for example, the daily newspaper uh, El País. And they had a problem that many companies had before. They forgot about this .git folder, which has a config file. And here, this config file included credentials for the GitLab. Um, that was a very simple cause with a large effect because uh, in this account uh, I had access to 478 projects, uh, which was, I don't know, probably all GitLab projects of this company, including some infrastructure as a code stuff. Um, so yeah, we had a vulnerability and then we tried to report it and that was quite hard in the beginning. I reported uh, Elasticsearch that leaked a uh, couple of months before to the same company. They never replied. Um, this time this issue was more severe. So I, I tried different channels. Uh, so first, of course, I wrote this email to to the company, but I also notified the third, but still there was no response. So I checked uh, for uh, people working at this company in the IT security department on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is great. Most of my LinkedIn friends had IT security issues. Um, <laughs> but this time um, we used Facebook to reach out to someone who was in IT security and finally we managed to get this uh, leak fixed. They um, th thanked me 
I, yeah, so until then, this process was perfect, more or less. And um, then they asked for a call. I sometimes say, yeah, okay, why not? Uh, because those people were quite friendly. Um, I told them when I would be available and then they were quiet. So in the end, there was a little drop in the performance, but it was okay. Something different, the United Nations HCR, um, they are not responsible and they do not care when it comes to data of other people. So there is this services advisor for different countries, for example, for Iraq, and it helps information for refugees that need help in, the, in those countries. Um, this service advisor leaked accounts of about 900 employees of, I don't know, dozens of aid organizations that are active in different parts of this country. And this time it was very interesting because the United Nations have a cert. So there's a place where I can go to to report issues. Um, first they said they are not the, the responsible entity for this because the UNHCR is different. Um, they are not covered by the cert. Later, I received a thank you for submitting this issue, but uh, the vulnerability was not fixed. Um, so I need to, needed to reach out to them again and again until um, even the last Gmail account, uh, well, it was in fact deleted. I, I don't know. They, they deleted some data and then um, the vulnerability couldn't be abused anymore. Also, they did not forget to mention the United Nations Hall of Fame program because as some other entities as well, they have a Hall of Fame where people uh, are mentioned after successfully reporting an IT security issue. But uh, here they only mentioned that the UNHCR does not fall onto, uh, under the Hall of Fame program. Um, maybe next time. IT security made in Germany. Um, let's. Hello. Yeah. Um, let's switch to IT security made in Germany. The TÜV Nord. They they even certify you when you are secure. Um, as other companies before, they had this issue with uh, .env and .git folders or files happens. But they chose to ignore the report. So I needed to reach out to them, I, I think via phone. Um, they ignored the email. Um, we had some discussions. Um, then they told me, this is not our IP space. We do not use the software anymore. Uh, it's not important to us. We cannot do nothing. Um, however, um, it's... IP space of the TÜV Nord, they still decided to not fix this issue and I did it this morning and um, yeah, if you like, go and check for data leaks in the TÜV Nord domain space. You will find database credentials and source code. You will find a Google service account that can still, well, access some services. And um, the database is not directly accessible, but um, they made it easy. There's Adminer and PHP Admin to allow access to databases. Um, there you will find uh, hash passwords of tufnot.com accounts. Um, I told them about this issue, but they said they have changed passwords. It's not a problem. Yeah, um, there was another interesting disclosure in December last year. Um, the US military was using those devices that you can see on the slide here. They used it to check people in Afghanistan and Iraq against watch lists. Um, they, they wanted to catch terrorists, I guess. And we found those devices on eBay. And in one of those devices, there was a biometric database of about um, two 2.5 thousand people. Um, we had up to 10 fingerprints per, pe uh, per person, iris scans, and uh, a photo from the face. Then there were details like name, height, sometimes weight, eye color, whatever. Um, 
Now, half a year later, a couple of weeks ago, they finally reached out to us. Uh, hello, this is Agent Smith. We would like to have our devices back. Um, also, they like to meet. They would even come to my hometown. Uh, and they, they have questions. Um, Hello, Agent Smith. I don't know if you are listening today. Um, I received your email about 10 days before camp. I was quite busy because of camp. Um, we will mention to reply soon. Um, in the meantime, if you would like to have such a device, um, they are still on eBay. <laughs> Um, however, um, it could be that some people will visit you if you do so, or the next time you travel to the US, it might be challenging to enter the country. Small fun fact, uh, I also learned by the US National Archives and Records Administration that I'm finally owner of the Chaos Computer Club. <laughs> Um, for every single data leak, this organization has a record and I ask for the record because they have freedom of information laws over there as well. They did not reply yet, but I'm really looking forward to read those documents that are somewhere. Um, yeah, that's it about the US Department of Defense. Um, we will come to one last very interesting uh, shoe shop on the internet. We are introducing the crypto king, uh, Philip Plein. Um, crypto king is a name this person shows himself, for himself. So he, he is the crypto king and in this shoe shop you can buy shiny shoes. They are a bit expensive, but I mean, they are shiny. You can pay with uh, Dogecoin or 24, well, in total, diff uh, 24 different cryptocurrencies. They, they have even Crypto King and Crypto Queen uh, watches. Um, the future is now. So, yeah, um, from a technical perspective, this issue was quite boring again. So we found a leak somewhere and there was this FTP server. So first mistake, storing customer's data on the FTP server. Um, then they lost credentials to the server, to us and to everyone else on the internet. Then they were ignoring all vulnerability reports and this time we were creative. We, we reached out to the CERT in Switzerland because uh, this company is based in Lugano, a very nice city. Uh, we re reached out to two DPAs because uh, they have uh, stores in the offline world as well, uh, including Ber Berlin, Kurfürstendamm. Uh, so I reached out to the Berlin DPA as well as to the Swiss DPA. Um, I called the hotline. Hotline. Um, I reached out to some people via LinkedIn, including the I don't know, not the CEO, but CIO possibly. Um, they ignored us. Um, however, we decided not to travel to Lugano, and we also did not send a fax. Um, I was checking from time to time if this vulnerability was eventually fixed uh, after, I don't know, two years maybe, or one and a half year, the server vanished from the internet. So this FTP server is just not available anymore, at least not under this IP address. Um, so if you bought something offline or online at this shop, it might be that someone else has this information as well. <laughs> and I... <laughs> <laughs> Um, to sum up this, this first part of the presentation, some lessons learned. So finding bugs is still easy. There are lots of very simple data leaks. It's boring to look into those data leaks from a technical perspective, but it becomes quite interesting if you check for the different um, behaviors companies have when you approach them about a data leak. So reporting bugs is the actually interesting thing here and sometimes you find very 
motivated people that are very happy that you approach them and that's really nice to to work with those people um, to make them understand what happened why that happened and how to prevent this mistake in the future um, for companies um, that could have such issues uh, please assume good intentions when people approach you um, they want to help sometimes by accident they do a mysql dump and not just a select count of rows or something like that um, please be prepared so make it easy for us to to approach you and have a plan what happens afterwards when you when we approach you and um, please keep us in the loop and also give some kind of acknowledgement because it happens quite often that a company reads your email fixes the issue but never says said thank you um, two or three hours ago there was this talk by uh, Lilith on the same stage here um, doing such stuff is very interesting from a direct action activist experience as well um, because uh, companies fail to inform affected people quite often public disclosure is needed however when doing IT security research at least in Germany there's always this hacker paragraph behind you that might uh, hurt you um, so um, yeah they suck please uh, remove them um, sometimes the responsible disclosure way is not the best way if you want to maximize impact but it's not always the most effective way to to do to change things and sometimes yeah shit posting is fun if company do mistakes uh, there are lots of golden opportunities <clears throat> so that was our uh, short dive into a couple of funny uh, stories from vulnerability reporting and uh, disclosure now the second part of this talk is what we call um, attacker infrastructure exploration. Exploration. So we uh, we got to know a little um, ransomware gang uh, initial access broker, and uh, we were uh, actually surprised uh, how they mess up. And of course, to those guys, you don't disclose; you just hand in a talk at camp. So. Welcome to our talk. Um, in Soviet Russia, incident response hacks you. And uh, so what, <laughs> it all started with an email uh, that went like this. DCCC, no spam, no joke. My employer was hacked. I was on the blue team. The hacker was mediocre, left a few traces. We were able to monitor him a bit. No data was stolen from us. The attacker attempted cab roasting to take over my beloved domain controller. I found an SSH key and IP and looked it up. Thanks to smart cards and labs, worse could be prevented. So they were, uh, they not, they not only um, survived the incident without uh, much uh, compromise, they also had this little SSH key that they were so friendly to share with us. Now, with this SSH key in my hand, I thought, oh, well, let's call Matthias and Dominic and see what we can do with this little SSH key. And I think Dominic will tell you all about it. Yeah, so this was a pretty interesting opportunity, um, not finding vulnerabilities in the infrastructure of like regular uh, organizations, but rather in some special organizations. So we asked around and we found um, uh, our friend Hackerman here who wanted to look into this further. So Hackerman did a bit of um, louder. <laughs> All right, can you turn the volume up? <laughs> Hackerman looked at uh, what happened, and we already knew from the first email, okay, the attackers compromised the victim. And uh, what they did there, uh, they created a scheduled task for uh, persistence. They dropped two binaries, Tor exe and SSH exe, and they had an SSH private key. Um, now, 
with this scheduled task, which was quite obfuscated, the Tor invocation, the SSH invocation was hidden amongst a lot of different commands to make it harder to spot. But in the end, we had a, a reverse shell connecting back to the attacker infrastructure. On the attacker infrastructure, you could find data not only from one victim, but from a, a lot of victims. There were plenty of SSH keys. And then you find the usual stuff from AD compromises, so from Windows uh, environment compromises. You find Kerber hosting tickets, Kerber information, you find complete Active Directory dumps, you find Elsass dumps, and you find the tooling that the group uses to do their exploitation. Now, our friend Hackback Man, of course, first made a backup of all that information just so that it doesn't go get lost, right? B better safe than sorry, so make a backup first, and then say, see what you can do with it. Now, interestingly, the first reverse shell worked with a low-privileged user, um, which connects to the server A. Hackback Man did a bit of poking around and realized the same SSH key could also be used to connect to the server as root. <laughs> so it's not only the, inf it's the victims that fuck up their configurations, also the ransomware crews, right? They all also make mistakes. Server hardening is hard, and sometimes mistakes happen. So with root access, of course, there was a lot more exploration that could be done. Um, but first, Hackback Man asked uh, us, hey, don't you want to help me in the notification process? Because that is a lot of work, as you have heard from Guntorkel here. So of course, we stepped in and, and helped out and notified in the, uh, 30 victims uh, that they've been breached. Now, if you ever wondered, what does a C2 server of some initial access broker ransomware crew game look like? It looks like this. This is the root folder, so uh, obviously uh, the crew was also working as root. <laughs> and they dropped everything there, right? They dropped all the data dumps in there, they, they had all of their scripts in there, they cloned Git repositories, they had some uh, automation tools, bash scripts, everything in the root folder. Uh, so this looks like the home folder of a very un unorganized penetration tester right there. The crew wasn't really sophisticated, right? I mean, they, they used a lot of open source tools. You can see a, a list of tools that was found on the server on the right side. Many things, if you're working in, in red teaming or penetration test, uh, testing, you might also have used. Uh, they also used the same tactics that, that a lot of the red teams use. I mean, makes sense. Red teams want to emulate real attackers after all, so apparently that seems to be working in this case. Uh, they try to stay away from the victim boxes as much as possible, try to do a, a lot of work over, um, over SOX proxies or, or over VPN connections if they manage to gain VPN access, uh, and then did exploration of the victim networks. In the bash history, of course, we also have a backup of the bash history. You could see um, also not only how they exploit the vulnerabilities, but also how they find the victims. Of course, they use Shodan, and they have a list of, of um, commands they use to find new victims to attack. Um, some more side information. So apparently, sometimes keyboard layouts are also hard. And uh, if you uh, forget to switch from Kyrillic keyboard layout, uh, to a US layout, then you might type in the wrong command. Uh, and that can be discovered in the bash history as well. Also, um, not only victims leak API keys uh, all in the bash history, you sometimes also find API keys. So we now have a nice showdown API key from this initial access broker. Of course, we don't, of course we don't use this. We just have it <laughs> as a backup. <laughs> so. One thought we, ha uh, we had um, while looking over this is, OK, they probably not only have one C2 server, they probably have multiple. Maybe they just clone the machine and reuse the same configuration everywhere. Maybe we can just scan the internet and find the same SSH host key to find more servers. But um, they did, after all, use individual keys per server. So that didn't work out in the end. So back to the disclosure. This is a, this is a disclosure talk. Uh, we had to notify 30 victims. Now, what you want, if, you're, uh, if you have a security incident, it just happens. Ideally, you want to detect it yourself. You have some infrastructure in place, maybe a seam, maybe a SOC, who knows. You want to evict the attacker. And ideally, you want to do it before you need to like, disclose to people that you lost all their data, before you need to involve law enforcement or whatever. What you don't want to happen is for CCC to call you and tell you, hey, 
we realize you have a breach. But that's exactly what happened. Um, so we uh, tried to figure out who to contact, which wasn't always easy. I mean, we had a lot of AD dumps, but it's not necessarily always st straightforward to figure out which AD dump belongs to which organization. And then the next, dump is, uh, next step is even mo more hard, uh, figuring out who to co contact in that uh, organization. Um, Fortunately, we have someone on our side who has a lot of experience with disclosing stuff to people. And we could reuse the same tactics, so uh, I'm not going to repeat the flowchart, but it's basically the same thing. Uh, we mostly try to contact security staff or, gen um, or uh, IT staff in general, but sometimes we also reach out to the company CEOs. Uh, we always try to go via email first. Um, we provided information about the br uh, breach and a list of indicators of compromise so that the um, companies could take action. Overall, um, we contacted 28 organizations. And in, um, in addition, we also um, gave the data on... Did we give the data? No, we, we also we just uh, informed the BSI and CERT Bund, so the German authorities, and the national certs from uh, the countries where we could figure them out. Some of the organizations actually responded really quickly. I think the, the fastest one uh, uh, wrote you an email two hours after we sent out the initial email. They were super grateful. Right? Uh, they, they weren't aware of the, the breach and uh, were, uh, thanked the CCC, uh, told, them, uh, told us how great they find this and, and promised to don donate money. I don't know if that happened in the end. And we try to get in a bit of an information exchange for them, so to, to ask them, hey, if you find other stuff in your network, particularly if you find new IP addresses or new SSH keys, we would be very interested in, interested in that. Now, if you compare the reaction um, from this incident response disclosure to the vulnerability disclosure, it was pretty similar. We had a couple of um, companies that really had the incident under control. They were already aware. They already evicted the attackers themselves. We had a couple of organizations which were grateful, which had more questions um, and, and wanted uh, our advice. And then we had a lot of organizations who didn't respond at all at first. So apparently, uh, companies are not only not interested in vulnerabilities, they are also not interested in them being breached, apparently. Um, this felt a little bit um, demotivating at first, but of course we are uh, also persistent. It's not only the attackers that are persistent. So we tried to reach out uh, via different memes, and you already know Matthias uh, Kantorkel's favorite uh, way to reach out is via LinkedIn. So Kantorkel now has a, a lot more LinkedIn friends, and some organizations have more uh, information about data they might have lost. Of the organizations that reacted well, one stood, uh, stood out. Um, they already had uh, seen the attacker and had already evicted them. Um, Kantorka provided them with a list of accounts where we knew that the, the attackers at least has had the um, Kerberos hashes of these accounts. Um, they checked it and said, okay, we already have this covered. We, ch we changed almost all of them already. And um, fortunately, they also figured out uh, where the scans came from, and they figured out new IP addresses that the uh, attackers were using and gave us an additional SSH key, which was re really nice of them, and we uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, this is now victim two, where we got a, a, an additional um, IP address and an additional SSH key. So that's server B. Server B was configured in a different manner. Hackback man, unfortunately, could not log into that server. Um, the login shell was sent, uh, set to bin four, so we couldn't. Uh, Hackback man couldn't get a shell on the server. But what he discovered is he could do port forwarding. And uh, uh, this way, of course, he could first try to basically port scan the server and see what local ports are open on that server. Um, and he discovered this way he could have tunnels to the victims' networks where there were active connections going on. 
There was also a very handy server running, a service running on that server. Uh, on port 80 of localhost, we had a web server, which just gave, us, uh, gave the output of uh, LSOF, so we could see uh, which ports were open. Now, if you uh, look carefully, okay, you see some SSH connections, which are the reverse shell that are still active. You can also see a pattern of the other open ports. They have 11109, 11102, 11105, and then you have a, a different set of ports all ending in 0902 and 05. That's quite curious, and uh, of course, if Hackback Man discovers such a thing, he wants to probe this further, and he wants to do a bit more enumeration. Turns out, these three ports are always forwarded to the victim networks. It's one RDP port, uh, it's one SSH port that's forwarded, and the other one, uh, did we ever uh, figure that out? Was it SMB or it was SMB, right? So uh, three interesting ports, and um, if you poke at these ports, you can figure out who they belong to, and that, of course, helps us in the disclosure uh, process, even if we cannot download files from the server or get a shell on that server. Um, so we could notify uh, more victims. I think overall, in the end, we uh, notified about 50 organizations um, that they had an issue. Um, not all of them responded to us. Uh, some of them asked us, what are we supposed to do? I mean, in general, what you're supposed to do is run incident response, and even though incident response always comes un unexpected, it's something that you can prepare for. Um, if I understand correctly, after this talk, there will be an incident response talk here, so maybe you should stick around and figure out how this uh, stuff works in detail. Now, we do have enough time for, for the bonus material, which is not related to this, uh, um, this let's say, C2 fuck-up uh, here, but, but uh, some other cases that we worked in the past. Nowadays, the ransomware crews um, have two ways to monetize uh, their, their access. The first way is the, is the classic way. They encrypt your network and then they demand a ransom so that you can get a decryption key and get back running. And the other way is they start to uh, exfiltrate the da your data and they threaten you to publish it if you don't pay up. Uh, and even though the internet in Germany is quite shitty, uh, they manage to, ex um, to exfiltrate more and more data nowadays. So um, we had some contacts with organization. The first one lost uh, 40 gig gigabyte of data. The second one lost a uh, third terabyte of data. And then we had a, a third one that lost even more. So good news, uh, internet uh, speed in Germany is getting better. Um, attackers are now able to exfiltrate terabytes of data in a short amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> but is that really that much of a problem? Of course it's a problem if you lose terabytes of your data, but uh, if it gets published, does anyone uh, really, is anyone really able to download it all? Kantorkel uh, spent a week trying to uh, download one of the, uh, the dumps. Uh, of course, this was published uh, over Tor, um, and they had their own web server which, which hosted this stuff. It's, it's one of these classic uh, ransomware disclosure blocks. But somehow they messed, their in, uh, messed up their infrastructure uh, there as well. Their HTTP server didn't uh, support range requests, and they gave uh, the wrong HTTP codes. And of course, also the infrastructure was, was unstable, so uh, downloads tended to, to end at some point in time. Um, we tried to use a, a tool, uh, Area 2 Onion Downloader, which in theory is great to do this stuff, but nevertheless, with this setup, we did not manage to download all of the data and, and uh, stopped after uh, we only had 20% after one week. So this is uh, actually a tactic of the, the attackers, right? They want your money. Uh, and this is why they, they steal your data. Uh, they are not really interested in your data. They are in, interested, interested in, in pressuring you into paying them. Uh, and this, uh, the same, of course, goes into pressuring you to pay them to take it back offline. Now, what lessons can we learn uh, from, from this experience? Of course, um, real-world uh, defenders have a lot of problems in, uh, in them having to defend a big infrastructure which has grown over a long uh, amount of time. Uh, mistakes happen and they, try to, uh, and they tend to compound, so uh, over time uh, your, uh, your security posture typically deteriorates. 
Um, but as Colin Torkel also pointed out, you often have lonesome heroes in IT who keep it all running and who give really uh, all the, the, their hearts to, to maintaining it and keeping it as, as secure as best as they can. Still, it often feels like the cards are stacked against the defenders, but as you can see, the attackers have similar problems when they maintain their own infrastructure, right? They also have a, a, growing, inf a growing C2 infrastructure, maintaining that it's difficult, configuration makes mistakes can happen. Um, credential management is hard, right? Sometimes you lose an SSH key and then people have, uh, have access to your uh, setup. And there's plenty of rooms for FabGov. It's not only C2 infrastructure, it's also the way you publish the data, and it might also be the way uh, you do encryption if you manage to encrypt the data, but that's a story for a different talk. We might tell that at, at Congress, maybe. Now, if you want to be a real-world hackback man, you see there's, there's a lot of angles that you can attack when you're looking at uh, the C2 infrastructure. Uh, ransomware crews obviously also have, have staffing problems. Not all of their staff is competent, and uh, some of them don't really know what they're doing. Um, they ha tend to be one-trick ponies, right? You saw the list of tools. None of this is hard to defend against. None of this is custom. Uh, it is known how to prevent all of these mistakes. So uh, don't despair, uh, it is possible to, to defend against these attackers uh, in many cases. Um, helping ran ransomware victims, um, of course, also is a lot of work, especially when you want to uh, get in touch with them, but it can be really rewarding if you manage to help them and if you manage to help them uh, actively uh, evict the attackers. With that being said, if you want to disclose uh, either vulnerabilities or um, give uh, SSH keys to the CCC, uh, there's an email address here that you can use for that, and we encourage you all to do so. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Du kannst die anmoderieren. <laughs> Any questions or SSH keys that you would have for us? <laughs> no questions. Great talk. <laughs> or, or, or the talk sucked. I don't know. I, uh, I never know. We'll see that. I don't. I don't. So you're, you're raising your hand. No. Oh, I thought the microphone was... I don't see the microphone. So do I get it right? To protect against data leaks, a good strategy is to just leak more data so you can download it? <laughs> <laughs> so the question was if the, the way to defense against data leaks is just to leak more data so that it ten, gets lost in the sea of data? I mean, have you seen these ransomware blocks? There's so much data out there. It's hard to download, but there is a ton. <laughs> So if I understand it correctly, you have to walk towards the microphone if you want to ask a question. There are no questions, so we can... Oh, no, there is one. I don't, there is a... So uh, do you think for a, a company, it might be a good idea to DDoS the leak platform instead of paying the ransomware? <laughs> I, I think the Tor network would not appreciate DDoS over Tor, <laughs> but can talk and can say something about that. I run for exit nodes. I would not like that. 